Luke 4, starting verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. This is the word of God. Hear it, believe it, live it. You may be seated. So, as most of you know, it usually gets on election Sunday is actually usually when we you know, talk a little bit about election and, and different things and what the scripture has to say. This has been a very odd year for a lot of ways and a lot of reasons. So we're actually going to take two weeks, okay? Part of the reason for two weeks, and I'm going to try very hard to accomplish everything I set forward to today, which means a lot of the stuff in your notes probably won't really get covered, okay? If it goes too long, we'll just have to bring and finish next week. Because this week I want to talk about issues, how we should see them biblically, and next week, I really just want to talk about God's sovereignty, how we can trust in Him, and where our real faith and our real hope lies, that it doesn't lie in winning elections or changing laws, but it lies within Christ. And so that's what I really want to have time to focus on next week. But for this week, what we want, I do want to talk about issues, because if the Bible is God's Word, we want to apply that to every area of our lives, right? And that includes voting. Right? Because we're given a vote. I think most of you do vote. And so, since we have that privilege in the United States or that right, how can we do that in obedience to Christ and to give glory to Him? Alright? Because those are questions we should be asking. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, where does... What does the Scripture say about the issues we're voting on? And what does Scripture say about character? Now, we don't have time to get into character. Okay? We don't. Alright? If you want, you know, that was, if, if you want to think about some of that, um, the Be That My Vision conference, those videos that are on our YouTube channel, go back, watch those, we dig into that, right? I can't do all, everything, every sermon, okay? Just can't. Not humanly possible, unless you want to be here a lot later. And we have a dinner, and I think most of you want to eat, so that's not going to happen. So what we're going to do today is take a biblical look at the issues in 2020. Now understand, this is not... Like, these aren't the only three issues. These aren't the only three issues the Bible speaks to. Nor are they necessarily, you know, maybe even you might even fit, maybe not the three most important. But these are three issues that I think are very important. I think Scripture speaks to. And so those are the three issues we're going to look at. Okay? Um, All Saints Day, you're like, how is that an issue? You see that on your thing? I'm just going to briefly talk about it because All Saints Day is November 1st. Okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about some church history and some saints who have gone before us in their positioning and their sacrifices in dealing with some of these issues. Okay? And that won't be just today, that will also be next week. So that's why that's in. So the issue I want to look at first is the Bible and abortion, the pro life movement. I think that's important. I think also, here's one that never, almost ever gets talked about by anybody. And that is the Bible and human trafficking. You just do not... I mean, it's amazing that we went through two debates and nobody asked the question about sexual, sexual trafficking, what is being done to stop it. I mean, it's not even asked. And it's not even... I think we want to be careful and just say, oh, well, it's the media hiding it. Listen, this isn't like something that's just happened recently. Like, this is the last, you know, 10 to 20 years nobody's talked about this, Okay. So we can't just say, well, it's today. Now. Like, it's just something. And not only does the media I want to talk about, we blame them or politicians, we as the church don't really talk about it either. Right? So we can point the fingers at other people, but we don't honestly, quite honestly talk about it either, do we? Or draw attention to it. And then finally, the Bible and freedom. And I would argue, actually, the third topic is the most important because that is the underlying 
uh, subject that really underlines everything else. Like everything else you can actually see stems from what we believe about freedom and what God says about freedom. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. So just a real quick, we talked about All Saints Day. Just to give you an idea of what is All Saints Day, I got the Britannica definition. All Saints Day, also called All Hallows Day, Day of Hallowness, or Feast of All Saints in the Christian Church, a day commemorating all the saints of the church, both known and unknown, who have atten attained heaven. It is a celebration on November 1st in the Western churches and on the first Sunday after Pentecost in the Eastern churches. In Roman Catholicism, the feast is usually a holy day of obligation. So just think about that, right? And you can see the connection where Halloween's gone a long ways from you know celebrating those who are in heaven. I'm pretty sure they don't, they don't, you know, in heaven they're not walking around looking like skeletons or white sheets, you know. Um, so just something to think about. Um, so just, you know, to put our focus on that, that, it's a day of celebrating those who have faithfully followed God, finished their race, and are enjoying Him right now in heaven. To celebrate their victory in Christ. Okay? And what we are trying to obtain ourselves. So, here's a couple of saints. So, the Bible and abortion. Before we talk about the Bible, I just want to make a point here. Church history has been very consistent with Scripture on this. And I'm going to start with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And most of you know he was murdered by the Nazi party during World War II, near the end of World War II. He says, The destruction of the embryo in the mother's womb is a violation of the right to live, which God has bestowed upon this nascent life. To raise the question whether we are here concerned already with a human being or not is merely to confuse the issue. Isn't that interesting? He said even it, that just confuses things. He says, the simple fact is that God certainly intended to create a human being. And that this life, human being, has been deliberately deprived of his life. And that is nothing but murder. That's true, isn't it? You know, we can argue about, you know, when is it really a life? You know, is it a heartbeat and all this stuff? But what we do know is this, that God intended it to be a life, didn't he? Now, briefly, so we see, so what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible speaks of life at conception. And I mean, it is incredible how often. So let's just look at one of these passages, Genesis 4.1. So Genesis 4.1 says, now Adam, so this is the first time we have a baby in the Bible, okay? First time, right? Adam and Eve, we've just had the fall, first time we have a baby. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Notice it didn't say, you know, they had a baby, or Eve bared and had a son. It says, they conceived. And it's amazing, and we're not going to go to all these, but I got these, you know. Pretty much in Scripture, it is almost every time you have a baby, it is so-and-so conceived. So-and-so knew so-and-so, and they conceived. And she conceived. And they conceived. And, and you, you don't believe me? Take, sit down with your Bible and start reading it, and just count all the times in Scripture when it talks about conception. It is pretty incredible. I mean, the Bible speaks as, of life as if it starts at conception. That's when it begins. And we know from science that all the genetic material is there at conception. It is there. And of course, we know that in most cases, the heart is beating when? Before the mom even knows, right? She's pregnant. Now, secondly, biblical law treated the unborn as persons with rights. Exodus 21. So what, the backdrop of Exodus 21 is the Ten Commandments, right? Exodus 20, you had the Ten Commandments, and then starting Exodus 21, you have what is called case laws, which is the apl application of the law. Okay? So it's saying, okay, so this is what the law says. Now here's the situation. This is how we apply the law to the situation, right? And so the law uh, really here that's in play here in Exodus 21, 22 would be thou shalt not kill, right? There, thou shalt not murder. So, Exodus 21, 22. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, all right? So, she, like, she gives birth premature, but the child's okay, right? The child doesn't die. 
The one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him. And he shall pay as the judge determines. So he's going to be fined, he's going to be in prison if he's committed this harm. But the child's okay. Now, next scenario. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, burn wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And this is even, it sounds like an accident. You have two guys fighting. There's a pregnant woman standing there, and they, someone actually bumps into her or hits her, and it causes her, her child to die in the womb. And he says, life for life. Life for life. That's what the text says. Life for life. So, Scripture, God gives the same protection to the unborn as he does to what? The born. The adult. It's the exact same. Isn't it interesting? That's the verb, you know, you hear a lot about eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Isn't it interesting that that's the, that's the context we find it within? That the law is fair and what ought to be done ought to be rightly paid out. So if you take a life, then your life is required to pay for the life that you took. And that is true even of the unborn. Now, I, I like this next one, actually. It was one of my favorite ones. John the Baptist was prophesying before he was born. All right, so Luke 1, I think this is one of the cool ones. You know, we're getting in on Christmas time. So, um, who knew you could actually go to Christmas passages when it's not Christmas? Like, they actually speak to other things. Imagine that. So Luke 1.39 in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this grand to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your... Greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken by the Lord. Mary walks into the room. And Elizabeth experiences apparently a child movement that says not a normal child movement. I don't know what child movements feel like and I shall never know and I praise the Lord for that. <laughs> <laughs> but something very different happens. John the Baptist, by the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, as an unborn child, recognizes that Jesus has just entered the room. And he responds with, with Elizabeth says, joy! Joy! The baby in my womb leaped for joy! Awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. That's incredible, isn't it? And of course, you know, I didn't put any of this research in there, but there's awesome research that talks about how babies can hear, that they can actually recognize music they heard inside the womb when they come out. Um, so like even, so let's say you play classical music, and then they come out and they hear rock music, they'll cry, but it's the other way too. Like, I would think you would just cry if you heard rock music. <laughs> right? if, you, if, if that's all they hear is rock music when they come out, and then they hear the, the classical, they're more likely to cry because that's different. It's out of tune. Like, it's just some really cool things like that that, that they recognize in the, in the room. So, I mean, it's very clear. Uh, not only do we see this in Scripture, you see what you would expect because God made the world, the same God that spoke Scripture, that this is true even within science. Okay? So, we see that's very clear. Now, one thing I want to point out here, I'm going to get pretty hard here in a moment, is that is we cannot forget God's grace. We cannot forget God's grace in all this. Because what I'm going to say, right, there are many who have had abortions or have worked in the abortion clinic, and God's grace is for them. God's grace is for the repentant sinner who says, I've sinned, I've done this wrong, I have this guilt. And they come to God, and God cleanses them. And not only do they come to God, they're not even second-class citizens. They're fully a part of God's family and His church. Okay? I want to be very clear on that because I'm going to say some very hard things here in a couple seconds. Because I'm going to say this. To hold fast to the idea, and that's the key here, to hold fast to this idea, 
right, to not be repentant, to hold fast to this idea that abortion is not wrong, is to hold to an idea condemned by God in His Word and His Church. And this holds true not today, but throughout all of church history and the ancient nation of Israel. I just want you to think about that. You are taking a position that is clearly outside the church and clearly outside the Word of God when you say, I don't really think abortion's a big deal. I don't think abortion matters. I think it's okay. I've heard all the excuses. Well, what about in the case of rape, right? Uh, I just say, first off, abortion is a way that covers crime, particularly rape. And that's going to actually flow into our next point. But I would ask you, is it okay? All right, let's say you have a two-year-old. And their dad goes off and murders somebody. Should we murder his two-year-old son because the father committed murder? Or what if, you know, heaven forbid, you know, a woman's raped and she chooses to have the child, but she's had her for a couple had, had, has had, had her, her child for a couple years. It's like, it just reminds me all the time of what happened. I don't want him anymore, and she just kills him. Why is that any different than when it's in the womb? I mean, it's a horrible thing. I'm not saying that isn't just a horrible thing. But abortion isn't the answer. And that's the point I want to put forward to you. It's God's grace and mercy and love. It's not, it's not punishing somebody for something they didn't do. I mean, if you want to allow that, then you have to at least allow for the idea that rapists should get the death penalty. Right? But why should you put to death somebody who didn't commit the crime? That just doesn't make sense. And um, let's look at Deuteronomy 24 quickly. Well, actually, no. So Deuteronomy, we're not going to go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is where um, it says in Scripture that, you know, where the point is made that the child should not pay for the sins of the father and the father shouldn't pay for the sins of the child. All right. But I do have here, um, I've got a quote from an article from CareNet, and I just think this is interesting. So here it is. The prevalence or forced abortion is especially disturbing trend in <coughs> sex trafficking. This was said by Laura J. Leader, the senior advisor on trafficking for the U.S. State Department. This is not some random person. This is somebody who deals with it. It is their job to deal with this. And she says that um, it's disturbing the connection between sex trafficking and abortion. While in forced prostitution, and this is, an, and this is um, somebody who's been rescued out of it, that was in the article, this is their testimony. While in forced prostitution, I saw 20 or 10 to 20 men a day. I did what he, the pimp, said because he got violent when I sassed him. I took all kinds of drugs, even though I didn't really like most of them. I had forced unprotected sex and got pregnant three times and had two abortions at a clinic. Afterward, I was back out on the streets again. I have so many scars all over my body and so many injuries and so many illnesses. I have hepatitis C and stomach and back pain and a lot of psychological issues. I tried to commit suicide several times. Kayla, sexual trafficking survivor. And we vote and continually put into positions of power politicians who say, yeah, let's give money to Planned Parenthood. Who are covering these things up. And I think it's absolutely ridiculous. And that really moves us into our next point, right? The Bible and human, human trafficking. Not just sex trafficking, but even human trafficking. You know, I would argue that God calls us to stand against the injustice. Um, we have some references here. And we're going to get to that. I'm going to... We just don't have time, so take these references and look them up on yourself, because we're going to dive into another text in a lot more detail, and these just kind of are extension from that. I also believe God condemns kidnapping in Exodus 21:16. We will go there. All right, that's we're going back to this, those case laws again that we see in Exodus. So Exodus 21. 16, 
Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. All right, so that is very clear. Because, you know, we, we talk about how scripture is even, or slavery is even allowed in the Old Testament. That was really in terms of either um, open war, or you became indebted and you went into slavery to pay off your debts. What scripture very clearly condemns, which is actually the type of slavery we had here in the United States, right, is kidnapping people and then selling them as slaves. Okay, forced labor of any kind. I mean, there, there's no two ways about this, is there? I mean, Scripture is very clear on this. And we also know, and we'll talk about that in the New Testament, because we have some issues with Paul, that a lot of the slaves in the Roman Empire, this is exactly their situation, right? I mean, it's the thought of one-third of the Roman Empire were slaves, all right? And how did they get those slaves? Well, Caesar <laughs> invades Gaul, right? And that's how they got rich. I mean, that was part of the reason for invading. You, you would take, you kill the men off, you'd sell the women and children as slaves, and that's how, and then Caesar would let the men do that. That was pretty, which was standard operating procedure, really, for most armies back then. And that's how the soldiers would make money and become rich and wealthy. Like, that's just how that worked back then. Okay? And so we're going to see in a little bit how the New Testament is very different. I just want to give you some numbers here to, to just have you understand this is a real problem. This isn't something we just should just overlook or like, well, yeah, that happens, but even in the United States, it's not that big of a deal. Well, here we go. Um, some numbers for you, and again, I got this from the CareNet. Worldwide, over one million children are trafficked each year and forced into sexual slavery and prostitution. In the United States, there are currently an estimated of 400,000 domestic minors involved in trafficking. Sex trafficking generates an estimated $39 billion a year as the demand for prostitution continues to rise. One million worldwide. I don't know what the death total from coronavirus is. I guess it's over a million now. I don't think it's over two million yet. I haven't looked lately. 400,000. We're told that by the end of this year, there'll be 400,000 deaths from COVID-19. And currently, this is estimated, and from a lot of stuff I read, that domestic um, or sex trafficking is highly underreported. So it's probably a lot worse than the numbers you see. You think if we reported on this like we do COVID, it might be a little bit bigger deal? People might be like, you know, pornography maybe really isn't just okay, because what does that fuel? It fuels a certain desires for certain things, which fuels the demand for prostitution, but then also fuels the demand for sex trafficking. Doesn't it? As well as lots of other things. Maybe we say, you know, maybe we don't need a Netflix subscription because they kind of promote movies that are just not wholesome of little girls. Maybe I need to rethink the movies I watch because, okay, maybe it's not sex slavery or little kids, but, you know, there's a lot of sex scenes, and I'm giving my money or support to an organization that, um, you know, is awakening things in young men and young girls that shouldn't be awakened. Increasing what? The demand. I know, that's like an old, that's like, I know, I, I'm sounding like an old, one of them old, you know, miserable Baptist preachers. You can't watch movies because I'm blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Well, maybe those old grumpy guys weren't as wrong as we like we'd like to think they were. It is now estimated that there are more people enslaved today today than in any other part of human history. Did you hear that? It is estimated that more people are in slavery today than in any other part in human history. And we keep talking about slavery that happened 100 years ago. Yeah, that was terrible and bad, but I would think that you might be concerned with the slavery that's going on now worldwide. Why is it okay to have slavery today, but it was wrong 100 years ago? Reports like these have drawn much attention to the plight of girls and boys as young as 14 who are forced to serve as prostitutes in major cities all over the country. A number of high-profile documentaries and the blockbuster film Taken have drawn public attention to the increase of increased epidemic of forced prostitution. That is true. If you've seen the movie Taken, it is, I don't know if I really, I wouldn't say I would recommend it, but it is pretty nasty and crude. 
just because, and it, it doesn't really show stuff, but it just the way he, the guy is going after his daughter who's been kidnapped, I mean, it's pretty brutal. Okay. So I got more statistics. You, they're in your notes. You can look them up. The, the one right here is HSI. That's um, ICE. I got that off the ICE website, which is something you've heard a lot, a, a little bit. Of, actually, you've actually heard a little bit about ICE. You know, in the last few, you know, you have some people saying they're bad, some people saying they're good. Well, the reality of it is, for everything I can actually find that's factual, they're actually quite good because they go. That's kind of what they do. They kind of basically stand around the border and try to nail sex traffickers when they come over the border. Okay. Um, I do want, so this is the only place really in the sermon where I'm going to talk about the candidates and where they really stand on an issue because you guys are smart people and you can look things up and figure things out by yourself. Also, I am not going to endorse a candidate for a lot, multiple reasons. One is there's just not a candidate I can trust enough to support. <laughs> but it goes beyond that. You are accountable to God who you vote for. You're not accountable to Ben Miller. Okay? But I do think, because we're people about the truth, I think it is okay for pastors to say, well, this is where, this is some things that they have done, which may shock you, may not, that, you know, kind of show what they, candidates fall on issues. Okay? And again, this whole sex thing is just not talked about by anybody. Okay? FOSTA, which was pre, and this happened, I believe, back in 2017. This is, I got this from a New York Post article. Though I guess they're not <coughs> considered reliable anymore. Though they were founded by Alexander Hamilton. So FOSTA, previously labeled SESTA, or the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act, paves the way for law enforcement to crack down on websites that facilitate sex trafficking, such as Backpage, Craigslist. Who ever thought Craigslist would be there? But there they are and other platforms where victims of human trafficking are bought and sold. Previously, websites were protected by the Communication Decency Act. Decency Act. Who had the audacity to call it a Decency Act? Which shielded them from being held responsible for the content other users may post to their domain. Now websites can be held accountable for knowing, knowingly facilitating sex trafficking. And this was, FOSTA was signed into law by President Donald Trump. Okay? It was signed into law by Mr. Trump. Last week, Backpage.com was seized by the Department of Justice, is after they said, or actually before, Justice, even before the bill was signed into law. The move was heralded as a huge victory for victims by uh, Representative Ann Wagner, Re Wagner, Republican Missouri, who spearheaded the historical leg legislation. Those women and children that had been sold with impunity by Backpage for 15 years. 15 years, and the government did nothing. Wagner told CNN, aside from Backpage, Wagner said just the introduction of the bill has disrupted 87% of the global ad volume. 30-plus websites and online platforms have either shut down or had major policy changes. Wagner says Craigslist shattered its personal ad section and Reddit changed its policy on paid services involving physical sexual content. Wagner said the new law will build on those victories. The legislation is going to give prosecutors the tools that they need to make sure that no online website platform businesses can ever reach the size and scope of Backpage.com. Wagner said noting various websites that facilitate sex trafficking and have grown over the years. And this is one of the things that I, you know, one of those little things that I found out about President Trump that really surprised me. Like when you think about some of the stuff you hear about him and his his background and some of it that being true, it's not the kind of thing you would expect that he would support heavily, not just in signing this bill, but in other things that deal with fighting sex trafficking. And the fact that he actually did mention in the debate, though very briefly when he talked about coyotes bringing kids over, he was talking about them bringing them over for sex trafficking. And if you remember, Biden denied that that even happens. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that everybody who comes over the border is a sex trafficker. That's not true. But to say it doesn't happen or just pretend like that's not happening is absolutely ridiculous. And this, <clears throat> last thing, so we talked about Trump. So this is, this is a Senate report. All right, got this from, th this is, 
um, the article I got, they're talking about a Senate report. This is the United States Senate. Okay? Yes, the United States Senate right now is led by Republicans, but if you remember, they don't all love Trump. So I just want to point that out to you. This is what the United States Senate thinks. We are talking millions of dollars, prostitution, human trafficking, and dealing with Russia and China. Not just among Hunter Biden, but among several other family members as well. There is no way Joe Biden is completely divorced from all of this. It shall also be mentioned that much of the testimony in the report came from Obama administration officials who admitted they warned Joe Biden about his son's dealings. Those warnings were ignored over and over, getting an answer to the question of why should be absolutely paramount leading up to the election. These are not just random people. These are not just, these are not, this is coming from the testimony of not some, you know, anonymous source. This is the testimony of people who worked in the Obama administration. Now, I'm not going to cite other things from like the computer and stuff because I do believe in this thing called you actually should have to come to trial and you're actually innocent and proved until guilty. Because we don't want to do what the mobs are doing. Well, you're guilty. But we don't care what the grand jury says. We, we want to examine the evidence. Listen. Now, there's more. I'm going to be honest with you. There's more things that deal with an election than just this. These issues I talked about. Um, so we're going to look here at the Bible of freedom. One thing I will, I want to throw out to you though, like so for example, the issue of abortion. Okay? There are times, because I just want to show you this real quick. There are times when you may vote a certain way, you could actually technically vote for, you could vote for somebody who isn't pro-life. You say, well, how could you do that? And this is how I'll show you. This is my example. So like, for example, if you wanted to vote third party, and I am not against third party voting. Take the Libertarian Party, for example. A lot of them tend to be pro-abortion or pro-choice. But the party takes the stance that the federal government should make no decision. They would actually probably do more to overturn an ovary's way than a lot of so-called pro-life senators. Because they would say the federal government should have no say. That is a decision for the states. Each state should make that decision for themselves. So there are times when you could. And so I just want to show you that there's ways to think about this stuff. There's ways to apply it. And you need to be careful. You need to weigh scripture. And you need to weigh the different things. And think, of, think those things through. For another example of way of thinking is a topic we didn't talk, we're not talking about. But again, um, marijuana. Should marijuana be legal? Libertarians a lot of times take that position. Okay? Now part of the problem with the libertarian ca candidate last time is because he thought it was a, he thought it was actually good for you. <laughs> Let me just say, there's a difference. See, here's what I'm trying to say. Though. There's a difference between saying, I don't think the government has the authority to regulate that, or at least on the federal level, as opposed to saying, I think that's good for you. He may, like the person running, might say, I think it's the most awful, terrible thing there ever was invented, and I think states should do all these terrible things to stop people from taking it. But I don't think it's the federal government's job. Now you may disagree with that, and that's fine. I'm not saying that he's right in saying that. I'm just trying to show you different thought. You know, there can be more at play. That's all I'm really trying to show you with that. Okay? Because um, I want you to think through it. And again, I'm not trying to say that you should vote for this candidate because X, Y, and Z. I do think you should take some of these things into consideration. Okay? So the Bible and freedom, and I think it. Why does freedom underline what we've talked about? Here's why. Think about abortion. Doesn't that child have a right to freedom of life? I mean, that's definitely a freedom issue. Same with, I could say, with the sex trafficking, obviously. Is that not a freedom issue? And I would argue freedom is really underlined, say, in the economy, right? Because Pastor Ben, you didn't talk about the economy, and that's the one thing everybody votes on. And that's probably true. And, th and that's fine. But do you have a free market economy? There's a reason the word free is put in a free market. <clears throat> or do you have a socialist type economy or government regulated economy? 
See, freedom is an issue. It is an underlying issue. And this is the one I knew we're not going to have a lot of time with. What I do want to point out is actually first, the second point is that is God lets people choose. If God lets people choose whether or not to follow him, whether or not to obey, if God lets people choose whether or not they should do the right thing or the wrong thing, I mean, what, who are we to take that freedom away? Um, and then finally, we're going to look at Luke 4 real quickly here. Because I'm going to wrap it up. And I'm going to wrap it up because I actually think I can get through it. So that's the good news. So Luke 4, right, we did this for scripture reading this morning. So Jesus comes to the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. And it was his custom, you know, he read scripture. So they, they hand him, you know, one of the scrolls. It happens to be Isaiah, which I think is God's providence. But notice that it says that he, he picked this passage out. Jesus didn't just open the scroll and said, oh, well, this is a good spot to start reading. No, he deliberately picked the passage. So he opens the scroll and he's through, you know, home through it, finds the passage, and he reads from it. And what does he read? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim what? Good news to the who? To the poor. What's the good news? The gospel. And I do think this refers to poor as in people who are poor, but it also refers to people who are poor in spirit, right? King David, who is rich, says, I am poor. <laughs> he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. And we've talked about being enslaved of sin, haven't we, the last few weeks? And we will again when we come back. As well as, guess what? Captives. I mean, it has been the position of the church to make a big deal about slavery. John Leyland, he was one of the, he was a Baptist preacher during the time of the uh, American independence. He actually advocated for buying slaves and setting them free. In fact, there are organizations in our world today where that's what they do. A lot of them Christian-based that will go out, buy people in slavery, and set them free. Or have some kind of thing set up to help them out of the sex trafficking or the sex industry. And recovering sight to the blind. We know Jesus restored sight, but he also opened the eyes, right? We didn't understand who God was or the goodness of the gospel. And he opened our spiritual eyes to see too, didn't he? To set liberty those who are oppressed. Hmm. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Paul says that the church is Christ's body. Don't you think the body of Christ should be about the same thing as Christ was. And I'm going to also tell you, say this, casting a vote is only a very actually small part of that. If you think the biggest part of setting captives free and doing your service to God is voting, then you've made a terrible mistake. There are so many other things. In fact, the early church wasn't really about changing the laws of the government. They were about just doing God's work. They were about going out and picking that child, that little one-year-old, that six-month-year-old that was abandoned on the street, because that's how you got rid of kids back then if you didn't want them. You just abandoned them on the street and raising them. Those were the kinds of the things the early church did. Because, you know, even if the government, you know, even if we vote a certain way and we see Roe versus way overturned, you know, and sex trafficking, you know, they... they, they you know, our government really cracks down on it. Who's going to love and care though for those victims? I mean, because that's pretty devastating. And really, without the government cracking down, who's going to care for them anyways? You know, we don't need a government law for us to go in and, and love them, do we? Oh, we don't need a law to tell us that we should show Christ's love to those who are high risk for abortion, do we? We don't need a law to tell us how to love people who have had abortions, do we? But we don't need a law change for those things. And the early church, really, the way in which they overturned the laws was by doing those things. But yeah, that's not to say you shouldn't vote, right? That's not my point. But let us be careful we don't get too fixed on those things. And we don't love the people God has put in our lives around. 
and we don't look for opportunities, and we don't take time to educate ourselves more on the sex trafficking trade, and exactly what would be helping out. Because it's kind of a tricky thing. All right? And so we need to take those responsibilities and take them seriously. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for Paul um, and Onesimus, but he was a slave that actually church tradition was mentioned in Philemon, who actually, most likely according to church history, uh, became the pastor of that church later on. So you just see that change. We know also um, just how Christianity changed the view of slavery, right? We, we sing at Christmas time, right? The slave is our brother. I mean, that, that, that's Christian thinking. And you're certainly going to treat somebody different when you think they're your brother. And you're probably not going to leave them in slavery that long if you view them as your brother, are you? And then, I like this by John Leland. He makes this argument for freedom on this. Notice this quote I got from a book I've read a long time ago, actually. John Leland, the influential Virginia Baptist preacher and associate of James Madison, focused on Christ's final judgment as one of his many scriptural arguments for religious liberty. Every man must give an account of himself to God, he wrote, and therefore every man ought to be at conscience, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ought to be at liberty to serve God in the way that he can best reconcile it to his conscience. If government can answer for individuals at the day of judgment, let men be controlled by it. In religious matters otherwise, let men be free. Leland liked so many of, his, of the historical advocates of religious liberty was not simply a philosopher or an author. He thought and wrote and acted. He did not just talk about religious liberty. He was an actor on the stage of history, turning ideas into reality. So to take home, those who are pro-abortion are placing themselves outside the church. Now again, you may, you, when you go to the polls, you may value certain things in Scripture differently than I do. Okay? But that's different than taking a position that abortion doesn't matter. And it shouldn't influence you at least in some way. Okay? A biblical view of human trafficking should affect your vote. Again, somehow, remember, when I say affect, I mean, we're only talking about three things within a much bigger perspective here. And when it comes, quite honestly, to the issue of freedom, I think there's things to be concerned on both major parties. Okay? Let, let, let's be honest. You know, do your research, look at their platforms. We got voter guides in the back. You know, look through them. If you can't bring yourself to vote for either, think of third party candidate. I, I have in the past done so. Okay, I mean, just think through those things. And that's what I'm really asking you. Just think through them. Think what God says and think through them. Freedom, freedom underlines all other ish, issues, I think, in this election, really as well as any election. Okay, I say in this election, if any election. And ultimately, let God's word dictate how you vote. Let God's word dictate how you vote. And I don't mean by that, you know, well, God, how should I vote? Flip a coin, heads or tails? You know, heads Republican, tails, yeah. No. No. Just sit down and think. And I want to leave you with this quote from really William Tyndale. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy who drives a plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. Why leave you with that? Because it is the scriptures that we go to. It's the scriptures that should move us to think. It was the scriptures that called John Leland to call out long before slavery was really taken as a serious issue to say it's wrong. And I think it should be the scriptures today that would cause us as a church to call sexual trafficking for what it is and how our society has become so sexualized that it doesn't even care that it happens. And you know who Tyndale was talking to? He was talking to the bishop. Because in his day, the plowboy, the scriptures weren't translated into the average language. And I can actually give you an example today of how what he's saying has come true. The Pope says that God's okay with same-sex marriage. 
you all know that Scripture is very clear that that is just not so. Therefore, despite all the Pope's training, you know more about the Scriptures and you know more about God than the Pope does. And that's why we stress the Scriptures and we stress what the Scripture says about issues. All right, to pray, uh, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We pray that your truth would reign in our hearts and our minds, Father God. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would take these things with us, Father God, throughout our day, throughout our life, that we would seek to serve you in many ways. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.